now, Hal Lindsey's Bible study of the book of John. The unique evidences of the resurrection. There are many evidences, and I've gone through a whole panoply of that usually at Easter time, the circumstantial evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there are many unique evidences in the Gospel of John uh, that are given to prove that Jesus was raised from the dead. They're not found anywhere else. It's interesting what he chooses to focus on that the other Gospel writers did not. And it shows the unique perspective of the Gospel of John. Remember, He's already seen the resurrected Jesus in all his power and glory on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote the book of Revelation before he wrote the Gospel of John. So he gives an interesting perspective. But before we start on this, I'm going to read a couple of things from something I got this week. Uh, this came out in the New York Times July the 6th. It's called Ancient Tablet Ignites Debate on Messiah and Resurrection. I didn't know what to expect when I saw that title. But I began to go through it and found that they ha there has been discovered, actually it's been around for a while, but no one studied it because a private archaeologist, Jewish archaeologist uh, collector, bought the thing as soon as it was discovered and kept it in his home in Switzerland. But what it was was a three-foot-tall stone tablet with 87 lines of Hebrew written on it. But uh, he had some archaeological friends, real scholars, who visited him, and they began to look at this uh, stone, and all of them could read the Hebrew. So they were reading the Hebrew along there. Some places were kind of hard to see because blotted out. Some was written in a uh, ink that was still there, but you had to use special kind of light to see it. But as they began to read through this, they said, wow, this is going to change the whole perspective of theology about Jesus. The first thing that they believe is that this stone was written uh, several decades just before Jesus was born. So, you know, there's no way to pin it down exactly, but we know from the uh, stone itself and from the, uh, from the way the script, that the uh, script the Hebrew is in, that it, was, it had to be in the time of Jesus whether it was just before a few it could have been a few decades before or during his life or just after his life it would have been in that time frame but most likely it wouldn't have been long after his life because it probably wouldn't have been after 70 AD because when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and Israel they scattered everybody and they that's probably when this stone was was uh, hidden but it was discovered at the Dead Sea on the Jordanian side, almost right across the Dead Sea from the uh, Qumran caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. There were some people who had it revealed to them out of the Scripture that there was going to be a suffering Messiah come and he was going to die for the sins of the people and he was going to be raised from the dead in three days. That is clear that it's in this text. Is that not exciting? Now, why did God wait till right now to unveil this? It's been around for 2,000 years at least. <laughs> because I believe God wants to leave the world with no excuse that they had witness about these things. And uh, you see, Jesus didn't need some obscure text, probably written by uh, some people who had, uh, you know, knowledge of, who had been supernaturally given knowledge of this prophecy that the suffering Messiah was coming. 
I believe that uh, he didn't have to have that, but it does show that there were people who did know and were looking for him. All right, now back to Luke 2. The, the, the important point is that it was revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, thou dost let thy bondservant depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Can you imagine the impact of this on Mary and Joseph? Here's this man who comes out of nowhere and takes the baby right out of her arms and starts giving this obviously anointed prophecy. And he quotes from prophecy about the suffering servant all the way through. Not about the second coming. The suffering servant. Isn't that exciting? And now God is, it, it, not that I needed it, but God is confirmed in a stone written somewhere around the time of Jesus that there were those who knew and believed that the suffering Messiah was coming and that he was going to die, and three days later he was going to be raised from the dead. And I believe it probably came before Jesus came because I believe the Holy Spirit was raising up a believing remnant around the time he came. To me, that's exciting. The unique evidences of the resurrection start in John 19, verse 38. And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. He came, therefore, and took away his body. Now, Joseph of Arimathea was a full-fledged member of the Sanhedrin. And it shows that the teaching of Jesus even penetrated that austere group. They were the supreme leaders both politically and spiritually of Israel, the Sanhedrin. He comes to Pilate in one of the other Gospels, I think in a couple of them, it says that when he came to ask for the body of Jesus, that Pilate was amazed that Jesus was already dead. So he sent for the centurion of the execution that commanded it to inquire whether he was dead. And the centurion came and said, he is indeed dead. Now that centurion had to tell the truth or he would have been crucified himself. So anybody that thinks that Jesus only swooned would have to take it up with a well-trained, battle-hardened centurion. He said he is dead. He knew what dead. He knew what death was. He had seen a lot of it. Besides that, he exclaimed, "This man had to be the son of God." So anyway, the body is given to Joseph of Arimathea in verse thirty-nine, and Nicodemus also, who had first come to him by night. Remember him, in chapter three. He's the one that got the greatest salvation message that Jesus ever gave. He, it finally got through to him, apparently. It says, Nicodemus came also, who had first come to him by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds in weight. Now, I know that Nicodemus was a believer. By the way, Nico means conquer, Demos, people. The conqueror of the people is his name. Now, how in the world he got that name, I don't know, but that's his name. Uh, but anyway, there's evidence, absolute evidence here that Nicodemus became a believer. What is it? A hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe would cost a year's wages of the average man. It, it, the truth of the matter is he risked his life to come and help bury him. 
And that shows he was a believer. Can't you imagine when Jesus spoke to him, he said in John chapter 3, verse 13, and no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. To me, that's one of the the brazen serpent, and this is one of the clearest explanations of what it takes to become a believer that there is in the Scripture. In Moses' day, the people had greatly sinned, and God was uh, angry with them, so he sent venomous vipers among them. And I mean, those people were dying all over the place. And they screamed, Moses, help us. So he went to God, and God said, take, a, take and make a brazen snake and put it on top of a pole. Put it in the middle of the camp. And he said, it shall come to pass that whenever a man or a woman looks at it, he shall live. Now, they may be way away, and they can barely see it, but the minute they look at it, God healed them, and they lived. And he said, in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up. And Jesus went on to say that whoever believes may in him have eternal life, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I can see Nicodemus at the crucifixion looking up and in bewilderment, the Holy Spirit's bringing back what he said to him that night. And that's when he came to believe. So here he is with another believer, and they come to prepare his body. All right, John 19. And Nicodemus came also by night, who had come by night, uh, brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a 100 pounds in weight. That's a lot. That's a fortune. Now, myrrh is like shellac. It's a very aromatic fragrance that's the substance of shellac. It's liquid and it dries very hard once it's in the air. Aloes was like a powdered fragrance, a sachet. And they would mix the aloes with the myrrh, and it would make a very, very fragrant, beautiful smell. Now, those are evidences of the resurrection right there, two of them, myrrh and aloes. The third, or I should yeah, the third thing, it says, And so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Where'd they get that custom? Egypt. They spent a little while in Egypt. And they kept the custom. They had one deviant, one deviation from the Egyptians. They never wrapped the head. They only wrapped the body up to the neck. Good verse. 41. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, on account of the Jewish day of preparation, because the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Beautiful, you know, there's a beautiful uh, discovery there in Jerusalem. Uh, If it's not the place where Jesus was buried, it's an exact replica of it. But there's a certain aura about that place that makes me believe Jesus was buried and resurrected there. It's about 200, less than 200 meters from where the hill that has a face of a skull on the face of it still is. Anyway, they took Jesus' body and they laid him in the tomb three days. And on the third night, as it, as it drifted toward morning, John takes up the first believer to come to the tomb. It's in John 20, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Sunday, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Well, you see, Jesus 
was raised from the dead sometime after midnight on uh, on Saturday night, which after midnight would be Sunday morning. Sometime during that period, from between midnight and uh, daylight, before it, daylight set in, the stone was rolled away. That wasn't to let Jesus out, and we'll see about that in a minute. It was to let people look in and see he wasn't there. So when Mary comes here, and I don't piece all this together at another time, when Mary comes here, there's no one there. Not even the Roman guard was there. So that shows us that something really dramatic and frightening had taken place. Because those Romans soldiers, the quaternion is what was, uh, at each watch there'd be a quaternion. A quaternion is a squad of 16 men. And 16 Roman soldiers could hold off an army until reinforcements got there. That's why they didn't need more than the quaternion. So they were able uh, to guard it against any intruder. But something happened that frightened even those battle-trained soldiers so much that they left. And for them to leave meant that they would be executed because the penalty for failing on watch was execution. And they would not have left before they checked in the tomb and made sure that the body wasn't there. And what those Roman soldiers saw was even more frightening. And so they bugged out. And it must have been shortly before Mary comes to the tomb. Now, what does she find? Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, John, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. That's because John was a teenager. And stooping and looking in, he, that is John, saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter, therefore, also came following him and he pushed him aside and entered the tomb, and he beheld the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the roll up here means very uh, uh, what would I say? Very carefully folded, that it was typical of Jesus, that he was neat, and it was very carefully folded and set over on the side. Now, so the other disciple who had first come, that's John, to the tomb entered then also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. There are three different words for seeing that are used here in the Greek. The first one is a Greek word which means to, you know, when John first comes to him, he looks in and he sees the linen wrappings lying there. And the word that is used, it means simply to see it, but without discerning or study or anything like that. He just saw it. He didn't know what it meant. And then the second word 
is used in verse 6 when Peter goes into the tomb and it says, he beheld the linen wrappings. And this is the word theoreo from which we get theory, to theorize. So Peter goes in and he gets right over these linen wrappings and he's studying them. He's trying to figure out what does this mean? And then John comes in with him, and it says, when he looked, got right over these linen cloths, and he looked at them, the darkness of that tomb, it says, he saw and believed. And this is a word that means to, to see with full understanding. In other words, when he looked at these linen wrappings, he looked at them, and he understood what must have happened. The question is, what did they see? What they saw was the linen wrappings in the perfect shape of Jesus' body, but with no body in it. They saw a cocoon, and the headscarf, was neatly folded and put over on the side the way Jesus would do it. Now, what what they were what Peter was trying to theorize and what John actually saw and understood was this: there was no way for them to extract the body of Jesus out of those linen wrappings without cutting them to pieces. It would have been impossible because you see the myrrh within. Within 10 to 12 hours, the myrrh would have dried to a very hard uh, substance. It's wrapped with the linen wrappings. So the myrrh held those wrappings together in exactly the shape of Jesus' body. And there's no way to have extracted his body out of it without a miracle. And that's why Jesus didn't have to have somebody roll away the stone. He went right through those linen wrappings without disturbing them. He went right through the wall. The angel came and opened the, the stone to let people know he's gone, not to let him out. He was gone. And John puts a postscript on this. Because it says that later, when they're all gathered together in a room with the door locked, and he's very specific, the door was locked, Jesus walks right through the wall and appears in their midst. So it shows that in the resurrection, there's a molecular atomic structure to our body that's very different than what it is now. And it says that that evidence was so strong that even though John did not understand the prophecy that Jesus had to be raised from the dead, that he had to have been raised from the dead. There was no other explanation for those grave clothes. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't God wonderful? I mean, when he wants to lay out some evidence, he lays it out. And you know what? In Acts, it talks about many of the priests in Jerusalem coming to the faith. I believe it was because they took the 20-minute walk that it would have taken from any place in Jerusalem to walk over to that tomb and look in and look at those grave clothes. And they saw, hey, this was a miracle. When Jesus was about to die. Just before he died, he shouted out, remember the victorious cry, to Tetelestai, which means paid in full. When Jesus was raised from the dead, it was God saying, amen, it has been paid in full. Because if there was one sin that any human in the history of mankind had committed that Jesus didn't pay for, that one sin would have kept him in the grave forever. So anytime you think, oh, this time he can't forgive me, 
Not this time. Remember, he's alive. And it means he paid. And you get back there and start walking with him before you get in the divine woodshed. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the greatness of your word. We thank you that there were some who knew there was a suffering Messiah coming and that he would die and be raised in three days. And Gabriel even commanded, you shall come alive in three days. Praise you, Jesus. Come soon. I'd like for you to open your Bible to John chapter 20, beginning with the 19th verse. When therefore it was evening on, the day, on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Well, that explains how Jesus got out of the undisturbed grave clothes, doesn't it? He went right through a solid wall and uh, came into the room. So uh, this shows that in our resurrection body, there's apparently going to be a completely different, we, we, have a, we will have a corporal physical body, but it will be uh, in, made of uh, a completely different sphere than what we know here but he was able to walk right through a wall and come in there when the doors were locked and uh, that explains to us how in the first part of john 20 that we studied last week he was able to come out of the cocoon that had been made by his body being wrapped like a mummy uh, coated with a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes shellac-like material, which formed the exact pattern of his body. And yet, when he was resurrected from the dead, he left a cocoon that was in the exact shape of his body without a head on it, because uh, it was a Jewish tradition not to wrap the head, but to put a, a napkin, a beautifully embroidered death napkin over their face. So this uh, shows that in our resurrection body, like his, we're going to be able to do some amazing things from a physical standpoint. Something else that comes out here. In verse 20 it says, And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side, and the disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Now this tells us that Jesus retained the scars from his crucifixion. I suppose that if you don't want scars from this life, that they won't be there. But Jesus chose to keep as an everlasting memorial the scars that he suffered in the crucifixion and the terrible beatings that he had when he t paid for our sins. And we will always see him with those reminders. I think it's a beautiful thing. Now... It says in verse 21, Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now this is a very important verse in this context because this is Jesus giving the great commission in the Gospel of John. Now the great commission was given in Matthew and Luke. Uh, we don't know whether it was given in the Gospel of Mark or not because we really don't know what the Gospel of Mark had after verse 8. There are some verses that were added, but there's no uh, textual support for it in the most ancient and the most trustworthy manuscripts that we have. So we don't know about Mark, but we know in Matthew and Luke that the Great Commission was given. And that was first in Matthew. He said, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and discipling them to follow him. So that was the great commission, to go out 
and to spread the gospel to all the world and make disciples. Luke says basically the same thing. His is a little different. If we look, just hold your place here and turn to the last chapter of Luke, just before John. It's in verse, chapter 24, beginning with uh, verse 46. Chapter 24, verse 46. And Jesus said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ, or the Messiah, should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you're to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. So that was the Great Commission as it's recorded in Luke. Now turning to chapter 20 again, when he says, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So he is sending all of us believers to go out and spread the gospel of how people can come to have forgiveness of sin and eternal life through faith in Christ. And uh, so it's in that context that we have to read the next few verses. A lot of people get lost in these next couple of verses because they're, they're uh, very different. So it says here in verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that in, in Luke, he said they were to wait in the city until they were clothed with power from on high. And then in Acts chapter 1, uh, on the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days after the uh, crucifixion, Pente Pentecost means 50 in Greek. So on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was sent to, uh, to take permanent residence in all those who had believed. And so that's when the Holy Spirit was first given in his New Testament ministries. It's a different ministry than was ever available to man before that day. And so we know that the real clothing of power of the Holy Spirit comes later. But apparently, Jesus was giving a temporary endowment of power from the Holy Spirit to sustain and guide them until the day of Pentecost came. And so, John just adds this was something that was done. Now, in uh, the next verse, here, here's, here's the Lulu coming up. Verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. All right, now what does that mean? You have to keep this in the context of it being John's uh, reflection of what Jesus said in the Great Commission. Now, when I go out to preach the gospel as I have by the grace of God in many, many parts of the world. When I go out to preach the gospel and I tell them what Jesus has done and I talk about the fact that Jesus Christ has paid for every sin we'll ever commit. He has purchased a pardon for everyone, but we have to receive it by an act of our will. You don't inherit it from your grandparents or your parents because they went to church. You don't get it by osmosis, by sitting in a church building. You have to receive it by a personal invitation. And so when someone receives Christ, and I, I tell them about it, they pray and they receive Christ, you know what I do? First thing I do is say, your sins are forgiven. That's what this means, that when they receive the gospel and receive Jesus Christ, 
we have the authority to tell people and assure them their sins are forgiven and they're heaven bound and Christ has them in his hand and no one can take us out of his hand. If they reject the gospel and we see that it is really a willful, uh, just a willful rejection of everything about Christ, we have the authority to say, your sins remain. And to quote a verse like one of the verses that brought me to Christ while I was reading the Gideon's New Testament on a tugboat, that verse in John 3.18 says, He that believes in, in him, Christ, is not condemned. But he who believes not has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, it is in that context that this is written. The sad thing is that this has been grasped and taken advantage of, I'm sorry to say, by the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. It's on the basis of this that priests have, uh, have claimed that they have the authority to take our forgiveness away from them, from us if we don't do certain things. Well, there's no such thing as purgatory. And there's no such thing as being able to add merit to what Christ has already done for you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, in order that no one can boast. And, you know, I, I by the grace of God, I've been allowed to lead a lot of people to Christ face to face, you know, just chance meetings. And uh, it, it, I never get over the joy of praying with someone and uh, they receive Christ and then to be able to sit there and say, welcome to God's forever family. You've just changed your eternal destiny. Now, in verse 24, we come to another uh, very important thing. In, in the last part of the Gospel of John, there are all kinds of commissions that he is doing here. And uh, this is one very, this is the highlight of uh, bringing people to saving faith. The purpose of this book, as I'm going to show in a moment, is to bring people to faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And here is one of the greatest living testimonies that John records here. In verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, and that's Greek for twin. He had a twin brother or something, I guess, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciple, therefore, disciples, therefore, were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I shall see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, Thomas is often called Thomas the Doubter. Uh, actually, I believe that uh, Thomas became uh, a skeptic because he had a temperament of pessimism. He was a real uh, pessimist. But on the other hand, he really loved Jesus. And he really had been accepted as a full apostle. But he needed to have something taught to him. And, and some of these vignettes that we see in the last part of the Gospel of John shows how Jesus is doing some real teaching here, some real uh, graduate course. So Thomas has said, boy, unless I put my hands into the, into the nail holes and my hand in the side, his side where the spear was, I won't believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, uh, came, the doors having been shut and stood in their midst. He's gone right through the wall again. 
the doors <coughs> being shut and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and be not unbelieving, but believing. Now this showed something else, didn't it? Not only showed that he could walk through a wall, but it shows he has uh, om om omniscience because no one told him what Thomas said. But Thomas recognizes that he knew everything he said. Because why? He's God. And so when Jesus comes to do this, finally Thomas is thoroughly shaken. And all of that uh, pessimism and skepticism seemed to be burned out of him in a flash. Because Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now that, you know, coming from his state of skepticism to worshiping him and, and immediately saying, you're my Lord and you're my God, is the biggest transition and the greatest change into true faith that you can imagine. And so John makes this the high point of the gospel here of recognizing just who Jesus is. Now notice, he's convinced the greatest skeptic. And uh, you know, let me give you a little vignette of of Thomas's uh, skepticism. Look at chapter 11. Verse, hold your place here, but look at chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. Jesus, Jesus said, Lazarus is dead. He says, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, therefore, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> Uh, he said that because he knew that in Jerusalem, Bethany is right by Ju Jerusalem, he knew that everyone was looking for him to put him to death. And so he had this loyalty to Jesus and a certain form of faith in Jesus, and he was ready to die with him. But that was about as far as his faith could go. I mean, he says, well, he's... There he goes again. He's going to get us all killed. We might as well go and die. <laughs> so you can see that uh, some real transition had to take place in Thomas to say, my Lord and my God. And in chapter 14 of uh, John, he said, in verse 4, and you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? So you can see he's he's very he's got a very stubborn skeptic skeptical streak in him. And yet finally he comes to this high point of anyone's faith where he recognizes who Jesus really is and he worships him as his Lord and his God. In John chapter 20 now, uh, verse 29, when he said, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. You know, uh, this is something that is very, very important for our day, especially in the church. And that is that uh, we have to realize God will accommodate our weak faith by giving us signs. And, uh, and he often does this. He will give us a sign or signs and able to show us that he is, he's real and that he's all powerful. That, in, in God's minds, that's having to use baby rattlers with us because that's not great faith, and that's not we should, what we should be seeking. 
He says, blessed are those who will not see, but yet believe. In other words, the greatest faith that God wants from us, what he seeks to develop in us, is to believe because it says so in God's word. To be able to trust what God says and treat it as already true and already real. And Jesus, uh, way back there, goodness, when was I? In John chapter 4. It was a long time ago, wasn't it? In John chapter 4, the man who came to uh, see Jesus, he was from Cana of Galilee. He came to see Jesus where he was healing. And when he heard that Jesus had come, verse 47, out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was requesting him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. And Jesus therefore said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. See, he said that rather disgustedly. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply won't believe. And that issue comes up again, right, that I just read in John chapter 20. At the end, Jesus wants us to believe because God says so. And uh, we need to focus on that. I know people, I, I see the great crowds that, you know, the faith healers come to town and it's like the circus game. And I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying that people will will come for hundreds of miles to see someone get up to perform signs and wonders but they won't walk around the block to learn from the word how to believe it. And so we really are in the days of Laodicea. The church has some strength, but very little. And mostly because people just haven't gotten the point that we need to learn to believe because of the word says so. And so at the highlight of what Jesus said, uh, Jesus commends here, he accepts Thomas's worship of him as Lord and God. And he says, because you have seen, you believe. In other words, what you see is correct, but you had to be coached along by having to have signs and seeing. And he says, more blessed are those who do not see, but yet believe. So that's a lesson that all of us need to remember. And I, I take a refresher course on that often, too. All right, now we come to uh, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. When I started out on this gospel, I, I talked about it because John gives the reason why he wrote this gospel and why he wrote it the way he did, because the fourth gospel is, in fact, different than the first three. Now, the Jesus seminar people, these so-called Jesus scholars who, who, uh, who refuse to believe anything the Scripture says about Jesus and yet pretend to be the representatives of the, of the Scripture, uh, they make a big point out of the fact that John is different than the first three gospels. They call the first three the synoptic gospels, and John is some kind of ethereal gospel. Well, the reason for uh, the way John wrote, he explains in these two verses, and he explains, he explains it very clearly. Uh, they also make a big point, by the way, that uh, John doesn't include most of what you find in the other first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, he explains all of that here if we listen to it. Let's read it. In John chapter 20, verse 30, Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So what's he telling us here? He's aware that there were many other miracles that Jesus did. He's aware that there were many other things that Jesus did that uh, were recorded in the 
Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke that he didn't include in here. So he wasn't ignorant of that. He tells us that this is a selective gospel. He selected true incidences out of the life of Jesus for a purpose. Now, so we learn here that this is a selective gospel. And uh, then it is also an att attested gospel because it says that he performed the signs that Jesus writes about here, uh, that he revealed here. Uh, he performed signs in the presence of all the disciples. So they're living witnesses to the truth of what he writes about here. And then he shows the purpose. Why did he write this? In verse 30, he says, but these have been written. These have been written. And then in the Greek, it's very clear here. These are these have been written for the purpose that it's a purpose clause. For the purpose that you may believe. So that's that's the main purpose that you may believe. What he wrote in this was selected, and the Holy Spirit put it together through him that people for the purpose that they would come to believe. You know, uh, this is something that is very, very important for our day, especially in the church. And that is that uh, we have to realize God will accommodate our weak faith by giving us signs. And... Uh, and he often does this. He will give us a sign or signs and able to show us that he is, he's real and that he's all powerful. But that, in, in God's minds, that's having to use baby rattlers with us because that's not great faith and that's not we should, what we should be seeking. He says, blessed are those who will not see but yet believe. In other words, the greatest faith that God wants from us, what he seeks to develop in us, is to believe because it says so in God's word. To be able to trust what God says and treat it as already true and already real. And Jesus, uh, way back there, goodness, when was I? In John chapter 4. It was a long time ago, wasn't it? In John chapter 4, the man who came to uh, see Jesus, he was from Cana of Galilee. He came to see Jesus where he was healing. And he, when, he, when he heard that Jesus had come, verse 47, out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was requesting him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. And Jesus therefore said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. See, he said that rather disgustedly. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply won't believe. And that issue comes up again, right, at, that I just read in John chapter 20. At the end, Jesus wants us to believe because God says so. And uh, we need to focus on that. I know people, I, I see the great crowds that, you know, the faith healers come to town and it's like the circus game. And I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying that people will, will come for hundreds of miles to see someone get up to perform signs and wonders but they won't walk around the block to learn from the word how to believe it. And so we really are in the days of Laodicea. The church has some strength, but very little. And mostly because people just haven't gotten the point that we need to learn to believe because of the word says so. And so at the highlight of what Jesus said, uh, Jesus 
commends here. He accepts Thomas's worship of him as Lord and God. And he says, because you have seen, you believe. In other words, what you see is correct, but you had to be coached along by having to have signs and seeing. And he says, more blessed are those who do not see, but yet believe. So that's a lesson that all of us need to remember. And I, I take a refresher course on that often too. All right, now we come to uh, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. When I started out on this gospel, I, I talked about it because John gives the reason why he wrote this gospel and why he wrote it the way he did. Because the fourth gospel is, in fact, different than the first three. Now, the Jesus seminar people, these so-called Jesus scholars who, who, uh, who refuse to believe anything the scripture says about Jesus and yet pretend to be the representatives of the, of the scripture, uh, they make a big point out of the fact that John is different than the first three gospels. They call the first three the synoptic gospels and John is some kind of ethereal gospel. Well, the reason for uh, the way John wrote, he explains in these two verses, and he explains, he explains it very clearly. In John chapter 20, verse 30, many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So what's he telling us here? He's aware that there were many other miracles that Jesus did. He's aware that there were many other things that Jesus did that uh, were recorded in the Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke that he didn't include in here. So he wasn't ignorant of that. He tells us that this is a selective gospel. He selected true incidences out of the life of Jesus for a purpose. Now, so we learn here that this is a selective gospel. And uh, then it is also an att attested gospel because it says that he performed the signs that Jesus writes about here, uh, that he reveals here. Uh, he performed signs in the presence of all the disciples. So they're living witnesses to the truth of what he writes about here. And then he shows the purpose. Why did he write this? In verse 30, he says, but these have been written. These have been written. And then in the Greek, it's very clear here. These are these have been written for the purpose that, it's a purpose clause, for the purpose that you may believe. So that's, that's the main purpose, that you may believe. What he wrote in this was selected, and the Holy Spirit put it together through him that people, for the purpose that they would come to believe. And as I was digging around on this, I, you know, I've taught the Gospel of John, well, I, I bet you a hundred times. And uh, I always learned something new. So I was poking around the original Greek of this passage, and I found something very, very wonderful to me anyway. I found that the word believe, the verb, comes from the word pastuo that in the best manuscripts, the word is a uh, aorist subjunctive verb. Whenever you've got a purpose clause, by the way, in Greek, they always use the word hina with the subjunctive mood. So that, 
explains why it's in the subjunctive mood is to be a, a purpose clause. But he uses the aorist tense verb here, which uh, in, in this context means something very, very important beyond what's obvious on the, on the written page. And that is this. It's what we call an ingressive aorist. It's, it's the, it's a point action looked at from entering into it. The aorist tense means point action. And it's looking into that point. And what do I mean here? To translate the meaning a Greek would get from it, these are written in order that you might come to once and for all believe at a point in time. In other words, he is showing that salvation faith is something that happens at a point in time. And the reason that he wrote this gospel was to bring people to that point. These are written in order that you might come to once and for all believe at a point of time. And then he shows the object of that belief that he is seeking to bring them to. These are written in order that you might come to believe, number one, that Jesus is the Messiah. The one promised in the prophets, the one that the Old Testament heralded as the uh, Savior of mankind, the one who would come and set up God's kingdom. He is this Messiah. I have written these things in order that you might come to believe once and for all that he is the Messiah. And two, the Son of God. You see, this was, uh, this was something that was very difficult and still difficult for, uh, Jewish people today, Israelites. It was very difficult for them to see that the, the Old Testament predicted that the Messiah was not going to be just this Superman. He was just not going to be this, uh, you know, men among men and prophet among prophet and so forth. The Messiah is not just the son of David. The Messiah is God. And when Jesus claimed that, they put him on the cross. They put him on the cross for claiming to be exactly what the Messiah was supposed to be, the son of God. Now you've heard this, I'm sure many times, this verse. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, El Gavor. Know what that means in Hebrew? Almighty God. In context... Who is being called here Almighty God? The child that would be born. So here is a human being born as a child, a son given by God, whose name will be God Almighty. Now, if that is not true, Isaiah was blaspheming. But no one ever stoned Isaiah for being a blasphemer because he gave all of the proofs of being a true prophet confirmed over the centuries. And so he says that this child that would be born, this son that would be given, will be called not only Wonderful Counselor, but God Almighty. You can't call a human being God unless God says it. And God said it. And then he says, e eternal father. The Hebrew literally says the father of eternity. The prince of peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace 
on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This is just one verse uh, that shows, but it, it's ironclad that the one who is born as the son of David is also God Almighty. Well, the Gospel of John is designed to put those two things together and bring you to believe it. You got it? All right, let's go back to John 20 now. I'm sorry, I, can, I could go all night on some of these things, but I dast not because I want to get through here. Now, he wants to bring us to once and for all believe this because once you believe this, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you and the faith that's the faith that's uh, done in a point of time is then augmented by the Holy Spirit who comes to give you a new life, the new birth. And that's what the next phrase says here. And that believing, and this is the same Greek word, pastuo, but now it's in the present participle, which means continuous action. And that believing, see, once you believe, once you come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, then God causes you to have a continuous faith. And that believing, you may have life in his name. So we see another few things here. Not only is the purpose that, but also... Uh, it shows that the objective, the, the objective of faith is to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. But it also shows this is an evangelistic gospel. In other words, this was written to be a tract. This was written for the specific purpose of winning people to faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah and Son of God. And so he tells us that outright. And that's why if someone says, you know, I want to start reading the Bible. I don't know anything about it. Where should I start? In Genesis? Meganoita. Oy vey. No. No. Start in the Gospel of John. What's the best-selling book in the history of the world? You're wrong the Gospel of John. Do you know that there have been more, more copies? That's why you find manuscript evidence of the Gospel of John all over the place because there was always more Gospels of John out there than anything else. And uh, it, it's, uh, it was written to be a standalone tract to get people to come to Christ. And it brought me to Christ no man brought me to Christ. God, using the gospel of John, brought me to faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, so it's an effective gospel, isn't it? Now, I think that shows us where what Jesus wants us to see, that uh, they can rail about the gospel of John not being like the synoptic gospels and that he left out things the others included and so forth. He told us that he was going to do that. He told us, I know, I know about all those other things. The Holy Spirit led me to write this for this purpose. And it has been effective. All right, now we're in chapter 21. In John chapter 21, beginning with verse 1 through 14, I, I entitled this uh, in verses 1 through 14. When in doubt, forget your calling. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's read. Starting verse 1. And after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, the, the twin, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. The only thing is he uses uh, uh, 
a form of the present tense, which means I'm going back to fishing as a living. Why would he do that? Because he's living on a big guilt trip. You see, when you deny that you know the Lord at the most critical hour of his life, and you do it with cursing and swearing, you'd be under a lot of guilt. And, you know, he can believe that Jesus still loves him and that he's still saved. But in Peter's mind, he's done something so bad that God can't use him. So the commission that he gave him and all of that, that's been nullified because of his sin. That's where Peter is right now. So he says, you know, I might as well go back to fishing again. I know I had a high future and a great calling, but I've been so uh, unfaithful. God can't use me anymore. So he put himself on the shelf. I've had things happen in my life where I said, God can't use me. And believe me, if I didn't have the Holy Spirit really make me believe that uh, God forgives when I confess my sins to him and I turn to him and love him, I would have put myself on the shelf permanently, and there would have been probably a few million people that didn't come to Christ because I was on the shelf by my own doing. If God's finished with you, you know what? You'll know it. But when I wake up in the morning, I I, I got so ridiculous, I gave myself this test in some of the times where I failed God, and I thought, boy, he'll never use me again. I finally pulled out a mirror and I put it under my nose. And when I saw there was a little bit of moisture on the mirror, I said, well, he can still use me. I'm still breathing. <laughs> Let's learn something that Jesus taught Peter here, okay? Because it, it, it's, it's a powerful, powerful message we should never, ever forget. Because there are a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ who are far less forgiving than God is. And it will be, they're happy to put you on a pedestal, but they're even quicker at stoning you. All right, let's look. I'm going back to fishing. And they said to him, we will also come with you. <laughs> he was going to take some of the other apostles with him. They were just going to flick it in and go back to being fishermen again. Well, that wasn't very pleasing to the Lord. They, uh, Verse 3, they went out and got into the boat, and that night, guess what? They caught nada. Now, let me tell you something. If you haven't found this out already, when you're out of fellowship with God, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Nothing. Without When the believer... When you're a believer, you're out of fellowship, nothing that counts is going to happen. And so we read in uh, verse 4, but when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus therefore said to them, children, it's <laughs> a good word for them right now, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? <laughs> Imagine that. Children. So you don't have any fish, do you? It's kind of like that. And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll find... And they cast therefore, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. <laughs> now here, there, what was their, uh, if, if these guys had learned anything in their whole life, what had they learned? How to be a fisherman. And now they're, they belong to Christ and they go out there and they're trying to do it in the flesh again. And 
with all of their expertise, they can't do anything. And when they follow what Jesus said, it almost sank the boat with fish. In verse 7, that disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, and that would be John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, uh, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. <laughs> now there's a guilt trip. It's kind of like uh, Adam and Eve sewing fig leaves together to cover their awareness of nakedness. What they're trying to do was cover their guilt, sense of guilt, with their own works. And Peter was out there, and he was stripped down to a loincloth. He was working all night. He was, you know, Peter was always fussing and stewing and, and uh, ranting and raving. And so when he found out the Lord was there, and he had told them to, he had told them to cast the net on the other side. Now they got so many fish they don't know what to do with them. He realized, my goodness, this is the Lord. And look at me. First of all, I'm sure he realized now I'm the guy that got him out there and said we're going to return to being fishermen again. And on top of that, he still had this big guilt complex about denying that he knew the Lord three times, the hour of his death. And so he's on a big guilt complex. And first he puts on his outer garments to cover his sense of guilt, trying to cover it. That didn't do, <laughs> that wasn't good enough, so he just threw himself into the sea. <laughs> Peter was always going to the extreme. If he's going the wrong way, he went to the extreme. If he's going to the right way, he went to the extreme. So, he throws himself in the sea, says in verse 8, But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but, uh, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. And so when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it, and bread. Now see, before they brought in the catch of fish, Jesus already had fish. And he was putting it on the fire. Boy, I mean, I'm getting hungry already. It's charcoal and fish. And he already had the, probably the best bread they ever tasted in their life because he just made it. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon that you're already in heaven as far as he's concerned.